All right. It looks like we should be live on Facebook. So I'm just going to go over on Facebook and just to verify it to be sure. If anybody is joining us this morning and you have any questions about natural history or uh, anything that you want to talk about with science or nature or fossils, feel free to leave us a comment in the comment section. We've got some people here who can answer your questions. So it does look like we are live. So I am going to do some introductions and we'll get started. Welcome to today's Museums from Your Home live stream presented by the University of Alabama Museums. My name is Rebecca Johnson and I am the communication specialist for UAME today for a discussion and a fun activity outside about deep time are Dr. John Friel, director of Alabama Museum of Natural History, Adiel Klumpmaker, who is the UA Museum's curator of paleontology, and Allie Sorley, who is the education outreach coordinator at the Alabama Museum of Natural History. Welcome everybody and good morning. Rebecca. Morning. Good morning, everyone. Well, uh, while we are broadcasting this morning, feel free to ask us any questions. You can drop them in the comments section, or if you actually want to join us on the live stream and talk to us through the video, you can click on the link in the description. It's very easy to do. You can do it either through a laptop or a desktop computer, or you can even do it through your smartphone. And just as a reminder, this is live, so anything can happen. So hang in with us in case we have any connection issues or Facebook has any issues. There's a lot of online activity at the websites and uh, bandwidths are trying to keep up with all of that. So just be patient with us in case anything uh, goes awry, but hope uh, good and we'll have a good time here this morning. All right, so now that we've gotten all that business out of the way, Allie, I see that you are outside. So what are you doing outside today? Well, first off, it's a beautiful day. And while we are under 24 hour um, stay at home, it is, we're still allowed to go outside at least once and why not go outside for a wonderful, geologic time activity. So this is our geologic time activity time. Look how beautiful the sky is. It is a gorgeous day. It is getting warmer out, which may or may not be a good thing for you. Um, and uh, it's just kind of the perfect day to be outside for a little bit. So uh, you wanted to talk to us today about deep time. What, what should we uh, be learning about deep time? Yeah, so we have an activity today that can be done. Um, this is our first installment of Family Fridays with the live streams for UA Museums. And so um, we have an activity that can be done at home with supplies you have at home that you can just find around the house um, that will sort of illustrate uh, geologic time and help put that massive and vast amount of time into a little bit of context and a little bit of perspective um, based on um, our history and, and just our understanding of things. So hopefully this whole activity should take about 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes um, and can be expanded on. So you can do this for um, everyone from your elementary age um, students to high school and above. Um, and it can be easily modified for any group um, and can be used multiple times and come back to again. And it's just a nice, uh, versatile, um, easy activity. Should we uh, go to talking about what people are going to need for this activity? Yeah, can you bring up those um, slides? So I have some slides together um, just so that while I'm talking, there's a little bit to reference. Um, that, oh, can you go back one real quick, Rebecca? Yeah, sure. Thank you. So I'm uh, basing this activity on a lesson plan that I found online um, that I've, I've used this lesson plan multiple, multiple times before um, and adapted it to our needs for the museum. But um, the link to that is at the bottom of this first slide um, that if you would like to access it yourself, you can um, go to that link and see it. Um, we can put the link to it in the comments also at the end of this video or somewhere where people can access it um, easier. But that's a lesson plan if you want to use it. It's, it's pretty easy to use. And if you are not someone who uses lesson plans on a daily basis and are just learning about lesson plans and how to utilize them, this is a nice um, entry one that you can kind of get your feet wet with. Okay, so for our activity, we're going to need a couple of things. Um, now, this video is live right now, but it's also being recorded and will be available 
to view um, where, Rebecca? Where can we view this after? Uh, you can view it right here on Facebook, and it will also be on the UA Museum's YouTube channel. Okay, excellent. So um, this list of, of, of materials is what you'll need. Um, don't worry about running to go grab them right this second, but um, later on when you go back and, if you would like to, go back and use this video and this presentation to do your activity at home, then here's that list of things you'll need. Let me switch my screen around real quick so you guys can see our list. Oh no, hang on. You can do it, phone. I believe in you. There it is. Okay. <laughs> All right. So this is our um, uh, materials list. So you need some, oh, excuse me, some yarn. Um, you'll need some markers or pens, some pieces of paper. I have some index cards because somehow I have vast, vast quantities of index cards at my house. Um, rulers, the important thing about the ruler is that it needs to have metric measurements on it. Um, we are using the metric system for this one, um, which is helpful because it's in units of 10. But, um, but so make sure that your ruler has metric measurements on it. You'll need some tape and then um, I'll explain what that is later, but just some paper that you have laying around. I also happen to have vast quantities of scrapbook paper in my house. So found another use for one or two sheets um, with this one. All right, so um, that is gonna be our, let me flip my screen around again. Sorry, everyone. Oh, I'm upside down. Okay. Um, so uh, that's gonna be our, it's just stuff that you have around the house. Um, and then we're gonna kind of go into real quick. I think the next slide, you okay. can share those slides again. Yeah, let me pull that back up. Let me know Excellent. when I get to the oh, slide, Alan. So um, right there is great. So um, this activity is going to, like I said, illustrate geologic time. It's all of Earth's history from the formation of the planet to right now. So we're about 4.6 billion years old as a planet. Um, I think we look pretty good for our age. Um, but uh, <laughs> this activity is going to help demonstrate that time in a more um, easily digestible way. So if we can go to the next slide, we'll talk about what we're going to do the geologic time scale with yarn today, basically. And so the next slide tells us what the geologic time scale is. Um, this is just one illustration. There's lots of different illustrations. One really wonderful one that you can use. Um, I have some resources at the very end of this um, that we'll talk about later, but there's a, a book called Lost Worlds in Alabama Rocks, which I um, will talk about later on some more, but there's some great um, images of, of geologic time in there. But what geologic time is, is a, the way to organize our history, our time and, and chunks of time. The time are based off of rock layers and, and the organisms that live inside them. Um, the deeper the rock is, the older it is. Uh, that's something called the law of superposition. And, um, we won't really go into the law of superposition today, but just as a heads up, um, if you think about it, as far as like that deeper down it goes, the older it is. If we think about our trash can in our kitchen or our house, and let's say we take out the trash on Sunday and uh, we take it out right after dinner on Sunday, don't really use it so much, but Monday morning we have breakfast and some trash that goes into um, that trash can from Monday morning's breakfast and then we have lunch and now that we're quarantined We're having it all in the same place at the same time because we're all eating from home all the time. But anyway, so we'll um, Put that trash in for breakfast for Monday and then we'll put lunch in there and, mon and Monday's dinner trash and then Tuesday's breakfast trash and Tuesday's lunch trash and Tuesday's dinner trash and if we were to when we go to take that trash out again at the end of the week the oldest trash that we have in there is the stuff at the bottom, the stuff that we put in at Monday's breakfast. The same idea works for rocks. Older it is, the lower, the deeper down it'll be. Um, so except, you know, rocks are made up of sediments and layers that were compressed and formed into rocks. So it's not quite the same as trash and we don't get to take them out. It takes longer than a week to make a rock layer. But um, that same idea of the deeper down you are, the older it is applies to rocks 
and what we're using or what uh, paleontologists and scientists are using to um, designate the eras of time that we have. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Oh, well, does um, Adiel or John have anything else they want to say about the geologic time scale? Uh, let, let, let me uh, pull them back on a second. Uh, Al, you're doing a great job. I mean, I'm, I'm okay, basically great. I have nothing to add at this point. Yeah, Adiel, uh, okay. I, I don't, I, Adiel, I, I don't know if you could hear that while I was uh, part point slides. Were you able to hear everything that Ali was saying? Yes, I did. Uh, yes, I did. Uh, it's not a great for me, to be honest. Okay. okay. Wonderful. All right. Good. So All right. we'll swap back to the slides. All Sorry right. Sorry to make this really tough on you, Rebecca. That's, that Can is totally fine. we all just talk fine. about how Rebecca is a rock star? <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca's a rock star. No, Thank you, Rebecca. Y'all are the stars of the show. All right, so I think we left out <laughs> on this, uh, this. Yes, excellent. Okay, so we're going to kind of get into this activity. So how does this thing work? So the first thing you only need to start out with is your yarn or your string, um, you know, rope, whatever you got around your house that you don't mind making a cut into. Um, I also happen to have copious amounts of yarn. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but I have a lot of crafting things at my house. Um, and so I ended up, I had some yarn um, that I was able to use for this activity. Um, we'll probably weave into a hat or something later on, a geologic time hat, if you will. Um, but for right now, the yarn that I had is, um, I'm gonna switch my screen one more time. All right, okay, so the yarn that I have right here, I've measured it out to um, 4.6 meters. Now, um, to do 4.6 meters, I, I do not have a meter stick around my house. Um, I, I have a feeling that a lot of you guys don't have a meter stick around your house. If you do, that's amazing. If you don't, you probably have a ruler um, that has some metric measurements on it or has metric measurements on it. Um, which is what I ended up using. So um, I was able to measure out um, 4.6 meters by um, essentially uh, ending the ruler and then starting it up again where I ended and ending the ruler and starting it up again where I ended to uh, the 460 centimeters that we need for 4.6 meters. Now the 4.6 meters represents the 4.6 billion years that Earth is old. Um, each meter represents a billion years, each centimeter is 10 million years, and each millimeter is 1 million years. So if we look at my ruler, Ooh, is it fuzzy? Can you see it? Uh, Here it is. I can tell okay. it's a ruler. So for I... each centimeter, you can tell it's a ruler? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, when you guys see your rulers, I know it's kind of tough to see here. I don't know how to focus it very well. But each centimeter those in between the two larger of the lines is 10 million years. And then each little bitty baby mark is a million. So we're going to um, use this as our um, measuring system for our, our activity. So I've got my 4.6 meter long string of yarn or length of yarn. If we'll go to the next slide. We'll talk about the next thing that we need. All right. Thank you. Um, so the next thing that you'll need, so again, because I don't have a meter stick around my house, I made a meter stick for myself, which is where that scrapbook paper I talked about came in. So um, I took a scrapbook paper and cut it into strips that were relatively the same length. I didn't, um, doesn't have to be perfect, just has to be the right length. Um, and then I just taped them together to make a meter stick. Um, and then on my meter stick, I, I measured it out with my ruler till I got to a meter. Um, on my meter stick, I ended up marking um, centimeters. And I have had time, a little time to prepare it, so I've marked the ones that we're going to use today. But So you can either mark it all the way down your meter stick if you'd like, or just a couple. Um, you get to choose how you want to. It is your meter stick. It is your possibilities. Um, and then I also marked millimeters there on the end. Um, just to help us out. But so I made a meter stick here. This is gonna help me with measurements when we put our events on this timeline. 
Um, I have a little crude um, diagram on the slide that you guys can use if you don't quite understand um, what I'm showing here. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, we'll do our last one. Okay, so the next thing that we'll need are sheets of paper um, or index cards. Those are the, remember I was telling you I have way too many index cards in my house. <laughs> Somehow I feel like index cards are one of those things that just accumulate and you don't really know why. Yeah. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, years later you look and then you are just overrun with index cards and you don't know what to do with them all. But one thing you can do with them is a geologic time activity like today. Um, so what I've done is you can see on the slide, I wrote down the five um, geologic time events that we're going to use today. And um, on my cards, I did the same thing that's on the slides here. The slides are for you guys. So if you'd like to use these events that we're talking about, um, you can write them down on your cards. I wrote my own um, and have them all with the years that they are. Um, written out no one thing I didn't do on mine is you can write the um the year million years ago that it is or billion years ago that it is and then write what the measurement would translate into um for your your yarn when we go to measure them so i did it on a cheat sheet on a separate one but you could actually write it on your cards themselves like so in for instance the um we'll talk about the um mass extinction um, that helped uh, or that that caused dinosaurs to go away. Um, and so that one's about 65 million years ago, give or take a couple days. And so that would be uh, 6.5 centimeters. And you could write that down at the bottom of the card. Um, so we've got our cards. We've got our yarn. We're going to need some tape. Um, trusty duct tape can't go wrong with duct tape. And then we've got our meter stick to help us measure. Okay, so I think we're ready to get this going. Um, can I see those slides one more time, Rebecca, please? Excellent. Hey, Allie, I was wondering, um, quick question for you, Allie. This was a slide comes up here. Yeah. Uh, for folks that don't have yarn or string, it seems like this could easily be adapted yeah. for using chalk and people could do it in their driveways. Yes. I think that might be an, uh, you know, an interactive version that people could do um, with their kids. I love to walk Absolutely. around my neighborhood and see driveways uh, where we've inspired school kids to go out with their parents and create one of these graphics. Um, I think that's a really neat, um, you know, and you can obviously add things to it in chalk and take them out. Kids can draw the dinosaurs, the mammoths, uh, some of the other fossils that you're going to be talking about. Absolutely. That's a great, yes, that's wonderful. And I think I might have accidentally, somewhere, I think in the slides I wrote chalk too. So I'm glad you said that because I, that okay. just lapsed from my brain. So thank you. Yes, absolutely. Chalk would be great. I had a bunch of chalk at my house. Um, which ended up in the museum, which is not at my house right now. Believe it or not, I don't live at the museum, even though I'm there a lot. <laughs> so <laughs> unfortunately, um, that's over there. But I think that that absolutely um, chalk would work great. OK, so let's go to our next slide. Make sure I didn't miss any of my notes. OK, let's do this thing. Is everyone ready? Oh, let's go back to the let's do this one. OK, so I'm going to do this kind of one handed. Um, so I apologize for any um, weird camera angles. Um, but we're going to start by laying out our um, deep time or our geologic time yarn. I have made some lengths of tape to help me. I wonder what my neighbors think of me right now. What is this lady doing outside taping things to our drug? Okay. All right, so I have taped one end of the yarn here. I'm gonna stretch this out. The one thing I will say with yarn, especially this one that I have, is to be careful. There's a lot of give in yarn, so you don't wanna stretch it too, too far. 
because then your measurements are going to be off. Um, if you do it with chalk, that'll be something you have to worry about a little bit less than others. Um, but this is our geologic timeline. Doesn't it look lovely? Nice and straight. Okay. Um, and then we're going to take... I hope this isn't making people too dizzy with me moving around. Is it making you guys dizzy? I, I think no, it's I'm great, fine. Allie. I'm fine. Okay. Um, so of our five um, activities that we have, we're going to go uh, oldest first, uh, furthest back first. Um, so we're going to talk... But before we do that, let me make sure. That, so I'm going to be saying that this part, this part of our line is going to be um, today, history today. Hello, today. How are you doing? It's right there. Then way over there is the beginning of our geologic time when Earth was uh, forming. Okay. So we are going to start here and measure backward to put our first event down. And our first event is gonna be earliest life, the first bacteria that we find. They are 3.5 billion years ago. 3.5 billion years ago. So we're gonna use our meter stick to measure. Remember every meter is a billion. So I need three and a half of these. So one meter that ends right there two meters. This is also a great lesson at the metric system. So it can be turned into a math lesson very, very easily. Three meters. Now I need to go half. And I just happened to mark half on mine. There's half. Okay, three and a half meters. Three and a half billion years ago, we had earliest life. Right there. So we are here today. And way down there in the little white square is the very first earliest life that we have, which is bacteria. Okay. That was our first one. So let's put some other things that are maybe a little bit more familiar to us in context. Um, the next one, let's go to the next one, which will be first fish. So first fish, oh actually, like I'm fish. sorry, first fish was not on the thing. I'm so sorry. Forget it, I just said that. That didn't happen, that's for later. You didn't see anything. Okay, first reptiles. First reptiles were in the coal age approximately 320 million years ago. Again, give or take a day or two. Um, but we are going to remember each centimeter for us is 10 million years. Um, so we are going to um, measure out 320 million years in our centimeters. This is going to be, does anyone have any, is any kids on there? Does anyone want to help me with some math? Feel free any to. Feel free to ask any questions in the comments or uh, 32, pop, pop in and right? say anything. 32. Okay. So 32 centimeters later, right here, this is our first reptiles. Three hundred and twenty million years ago. So very first life was way down there, and the coal age and first reptiles are way over here. So coal age is actually kind of an important time for Alabama. Um, one of the industries in Alabama that we have um, that's prominent is the coal industry. And coal industry, a lot of the coal that we are digging up to use for electricity and other things, was laid down um, in forests or it, it's basically really old really smushed together really old plants and the plants that were alive that turned into this coal that we see today came from this coal age time which is right over here it's also some really neat mm -hmm. 
um, early reptiles that came at that time. And we have a we had a wonderful exhibit a little while ago about um, footprints that were found um, at different coal mines in Alabama um, that showed some of these early reptiles, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, okay. Yeah, Allie. Let's go to our next one. Um, oh, I, yeah. I, I have a little, a little, a little comment about this. Um, recently, yeah. Adiel and I went to this looking for coal age fossils and were able to find some right along oh, cool. Jackway in Tuscaloosa. So you, you can literally find them That's right amazing. here in the Tuscaloosa area, this part of Alabama. It's really neat going out with Adi expertise, and we could we found a bunch of fossil plants in trackways, but uh, definitely some coal in these uh, animals that had died and been I'm, converted you know, to uh, coal. Yeah, I'm glad you said that, too, because... Oh, sorry, Adiel. So yeah, sometimes the uh, Department of Geological Sciences brings their students there as well to take a look at the, the layers of rock there, sandstones mostly, in which you can find these fossil plants. So it's being actively used on campus too. Um, if anyone on the stream or if John or Adiel have heard of um, Hurricane Creek Park, it's a para park. Um, if you go hiking in there, there's some really beautiful rock formations, and you can see um, coal age plants in the rock formation, which I think is kind of neat. Yep. You can also find coal in the creek itself, little pieces of coal in the creek itself. Okay, so our next one we're going to do is origins of mammals. Oh, that's my fingers, I'm sorry. Origin of mammals and first dinos, because I think everyone loves a good dino. Let me see if I can flip over. I wore a specific necklace today. Everyone see it? Whoa. Allie is quite the fashion maven. She has a lot of named, uh, clothing and jewelry items. Pretty awesome. Is that a T-Rex or some kind of a... Uh... That one is a T-Rex. I got it from a good friend of mine. Mm -hmm. um, so our next one is um, first mammals, 245 million years ago, which would give us 24 and a half centimeters, which I have already marked out because I had a little bit of time to mark things out beforehand, which if you guys want to mark them out on your meter stick before, that might not be a bad idea. So you can do a little bit of prep work before um, you go outside for this one. All right. There's 24. Hello, first dinos. How are you doing? You live right there. Okay. So let's just think about this again real quick. First life. We got a lot of time. There's, I mean, there's a lot happening here. We obviously, we're just covering five events. But first life, then we get to the thing, dinos, that I think a lot of us are really familiar with. All right, let's do our next one. Next one is another, I chose this one because it's something I think a lot of us are familiar with, the mass extinction that um, did the dinosaurs in and a bunch of other plants and life that was around at that time. Um, that happened about 65 million years ago, maybe a little bit more actually, but 65 just for the sake of nice numbers that we can use. Um, so 65 million years ago, mass extinction, right there. Uh-oh, we're getting pretty close timeline-wise to where we are considering where we started. All right, let's do our next one, our last event for us today. That is mammoths, mastodons, modern humans, modern us. So that's about 1.8 million years ago is when mammoths, mastodons, and, and us were around, which on our time scale is uh, two millimeters, okay, two millimeters. So the end of my, um, the end of my yarn is right here. If I were to go in two millimeters, I can't even cover it with the tape, it's too little. We are right there. So, 
those are our five events in our geologic time activity. If you, I don't know if this helps. I think this is an incredible way to show geologic time and just the amount of history that our planet has been through and to show the different, kind of give us an idea of different major events in our planet's history and their relation to each other. Um, it also shows you, like down here, earliest life happens quite a bit of ways away from when Earth was formed. There's a lot of stuff happening in here that early, that um, not even bacteria was around for, which I think is kind of interesting. Now on that slide thing, the slideshow, you can see there's another slide that said, um, the next slide says, what other events would you like to add? So you guys can do research at, at home on your own and find other events in geologic history that you're interested in. Maybe you're interested in when the first fish came around, or maybe you're interested in um, when, um, um, you know, Megalodon was around. Maybe I'm you're like, interested in some other I'm interested things when the in geologic time that. When the first animals left uh, aquatic environments and entered land, I think that'd be a really neat one to find. And you could vertebrates and ones for vertebrates. Yes. That's wonderful. Yes, exactly. So that's why this activity is a really great one to do at home. Um, it is adaptable. It's versatile. It can take as long or as little as you'd like. And you can even come back to it several days. So this could even be a unit if you'd like it to be. Um, if you use chalk or even if you don't, don't use chalk, you can draw a pit that you're talking about. Um, you can turn this into a wonderful math lesson and, and get familiar with the metric system. This is an easy activity that we did these five with my including commentary in about 30 minutes or so. Um, it's just a really wonderful activity. So hopefully this is something that you can use at home. I know that we're all kind of in um, different times that some instruction is happening at home more so than maybe before. Um, and so hopefully this is an activity that can help you um, with your at-home instruction. And when uh, classes are in session again after this pandemic is over, you could actually use people too to represent uh, the, the first fish, for example. I've done this in class a long time ago, but then with the distance of the planets from the sun, but you can apply this too to this type of activity. Yes, exactly. Yeah, deep time is a really interesting um, concept. Um, you know, we talk, we're talking about here in a geological sense, but uh, you know, one of these things is, um, Astronomers also think about deep time. So the, the thing, if you really want your mind, you think about when some of these events were happening elsewhere in the universe, and that um, we talk about, you know, the the uh, Ali mentioned a book we did an exhibit about trackways. Hired one of the people that was the driving force behind it was Ron Buda, who's an astronomer, and he really thinks in deep time. And you know, his book, um, if you read it, his figures in there where you can kind of uh, touch on like elsewhere in the universe when you know the first mammals were uh, appearing. Uh, it's, it's just a really neat concept that, that uh, he's talking about the fossil record here, but uh, you can expand it in so many ways. Um, and the idea is that you know we're you know we, we're actually seeing things in the, in the night sky tonight that events that were happening when some of these geological events were happening. It's really uh, for all ages. I think that is just mind blowing to connect deep time. Uh, looking at ontology with space time. Um, they are intimately connected, but a lot of people don't make that connection. Are you still there, Allie? Oh, it sounds like you're going inside. Yeah. Or at least I seems heard. Seems like she's <laughs> she might be going inside. So should we uh Can back that ever come in? Uh, we don't have any questions as of yet. I don't know if people are still uh, waking up this morning, uh, uh, but uh, we do have some people watching. And uh, I, I, I did want to ask, um, I know uh, you've been doing a lot of things with fossils and you, uh, you post a Fossil Friday every, every Friday. And uh, I was wondering if you uh, wanted to talk about that at all. 
Yeah, absolutely. So every Friday I post a uh, picture of a fossil on Twitter. It's accessible to everybody. And usually those fossils are from the Alabama Museum of Natural History collections. In fact, uh, or will be soon part of the collections because they have just been collected, right? So what I try to do there is add one, two, or three pictures each Friday. And after I do that, I post a little bit of a story on it, what, what it is, where it comes from, how old it is, uh, what it may tell us about ancient life, mostly in Alabama. And so everybody's able to, uh, to comment on that and use it as they, as they like. So it's outreach. It's a great hashtag. To see the, uh, the variety of life that had existed in Alabama for the last, well, at least 500 million years or so. Really. So these can be pictures that have been taken in the field directly, like the this hat. week's one. Or those can be uh, pictures based on specimens that are in the collection already that I have to find in the collection. And uh, I take them out either in my office or outside and take a picture. Uh, with a appropriate background. Yeah. So this week's one. Yeah, that hashtag um, fossil. Whoops. I was going to say that that hashtag fossil Friday, if not thousands of paleontologists uh, post on that. So Adiel's our local paleontologist, but uh, I've got on social media because there's just fossils from all over the world. Um, times I recognize, but it's it just really, of all the kind of Social media hashtags that are music is really one I recommend following. Just amazing stuff. Uh, almost every museum has uh, one or more paleontologists on their staff that are posting something on social media each Friday, from often from their own individual museum collections. Yeah, so the one that I posted this week is now on the screen, and uh, this was a picture taken in fields. In particular, at Harold Station some time ago when we were still able to go out. And what you see right here is two shells. Now, these shells are not actual shells, uh, but they are part of an ammonite, which is an ancient squid that used to live inside a, uh, a shell. In fact, these ammonites went extinct about 65 million years ago. I only talked about this uh, earlier in this uh, broadcast. And the closest relative today is a normal shell. So think of a shell and many arms sticking out, essentially. That's what an ammonite was back in the days as well. In addition to the external shell in which the squid was hiding, they also had a lid or a jaw. Uh, and just aren't sure what these two shells here exactly are, uh, but they, they can either be used to close up the, uh, the opening of the shell but the other pins, I'll just say, they've also been used as, as jaws to, to collect food on the, on the bottom of the ocean. In, fact. in this case, what you see right here is are these two shells here that most likely belong to the same ammonite animal, uh, yet the ammonite shell is gone because it has dissolved. Because it's uh, the shell of the ammonite is made out of calcium carbonate, particularly aragonite. And aragonite is relatively unstable and it's going to dissolve in some cases, which it has done in this case, but the, uh, the two valves you see right there are calcitic, which is the more stable form of calcium carbonate, which is why you have those two preserved in the ancient shell. Uh, so it's really rare to find uh, these two jaw parts or lip parts together, so to say. So it, it was, I was stunned when I stumbled across this in Harold Station in the UA. You experience a your field site in the central Alabama, and uh, maybe you took a picture, collected the specimens, and there will be accessions in, accession in the UN museum collections uh, after the pandemic is over. So I didn't realize, I mean, I, I know that modern octopuses and squids have beaks uh, that are in these characterized mouth structures almost like a bird that ammonites uh, may have had. It looks like it was mineralized, at least in the case of uh, the ammonites. That's I mean, yeah. that's what I love about being working in museums is every day we have so many experts that have such deep knowledge. Um, so I think a lot of us may not, well, I know I appreciate it 
but uh, really strong. People are always drawn to dinosaurs and uh, vertebrate fossils. Uh, I, I have that bias, but Adiel is an invertebrate paleontologist, and there are such interesting stories about invertebrate fossils that Adiel is telling now in Alabama, and it's really exciting here less than six months, but I've learned more from him about Alabama uh, invertebrate paleontology, animals that don't have a backbone. Uh, I, I know there's going to be really neat discoveries he's going to make uh, working in the state here because it's an uh, area of paleontology locally, which just I don't think has been explored. Uh, the depth that uh, people have been looking for mosasaurs and dinosaurs and other big bony things, but uh, I'm really looking forward to the uh, science that Adiel is going to be doing here in Alabama. Yeah, there's a lot to explore, and I should say for Fossil Friday, I'm not restricting myself to inverts only. I try to highlight different parts of the UA Museum's collections, like plants, like trackways, uh, like vertebrate fossils as well, like mosasaurs as well. But obviously, I'm going to include inverted fossils as well. Uh, did some posts about crabs, which is one of my specialties for my research, and you know. So the research that will be coming out of a study of fossil collections here and then elsewhere in Alabama um, will be about uh, fossil crustaceans. Uh, there are lots of fossil crustaceans there yeah, that have been very much understudied. So I'm, yeah. I'm working on something else. I research. Go ahead, John. Oh, I said something else that I really like about your research, and it's a good for people. You know, we sometimes think about past events as being unique. And what I like to remind people, all the things that you see today between living organisms, um, things, how they change over time, how they, things eat other things in the past. And Adiel's research, he actually studies predation, uh, what eating in the past and how they were doing it. Uh, so the same kind of events you may see today at a beach in Alabama, Adiel can study in the very distant past looking at the scars and, and things like that that they find on fossils and crab and lobster um, bodies. Uh, so that, I think that's a really neat idea does that. Uh, again, I don't know if anyone wants to say any more than that. Fascinating. Maybe, yeah, and maybe. The thing about doing research on, on predation parasitism as well, to a certain extent, is that it involves a variety of animals, not only crabs, not only mosasaurs, not only sharks. The, these animals all interact with one another, so you've got to learn and study a variety of different animals. Ultimately, you want to see how food webs were uh, in the past in comparison to today's food webs. Right? So you've got to study all the clues you can gather from uh, the animals that are not moving anymore and are now part of the fossil record. So oftentimes, you have to rely on stomach content of animals, uh, traces that they may leave behind as they attack other animals. Uh, like repair scars that you may find in a variety of shells, like uh, drill holes made by snails to get access to anything that's inside a clam, right? Um, so all these clues can give you a sense of what was eating uh, what animal, uh, how often did it occur, uh, where was the site of attack of an animal, uh, are there any changes over time uh, you see in the uh, attack frequency. And what does that mean? So there's a ton of questions that can be asked using uh, not only one single animal, but a variety of animals, ultimately the entire collection, the Alabama Museum of Natural History and other collections uh, elsewhere in the world too. So there's there's a there's a ton to explore. Maybe we could use um, we could create a geologic deep time activity like the one that we did outside but for fossil examples in our collection we'll have to see if we can put that together that'd be kind of neat well absolutely and we've got a great collection we've got fossils all the way up to 500 million years old to essentially mastodon and, and see that's and i think animals from the ice age that's incredible i think that's one of the things especially about alabama that people don't quite realize is the breadth of, of fossil diversity that we have just in our little, I mean, relatively small state. We've got a ton here. Um, if everyone gets a chance to look up the geologic map of Alabama, you'll get to see just how many types of rocks that we have um, that were all laid down from different time periods. 
um, with different um, environments and habitats and, and the things that lived inside them, just like we have happening today. We are an incredibly biodiverse state and it's because of the rocks. Same thing goes for our fossil record. Would you agree, Adia, Dr. Quantmaker? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's uh, rocks of Cambrian age, so about 500 million years old, uh, all the way up to Pleistocene, so let's say one, one million years old. Um, so you can essentially walk through time, going from the oldest fossils from, from, from Alabama all the way to uh, fossils that are very similar to the ones that are living today. So, so it's essentially walk from time going from north state we have steam rocks all the way to south we've got rocks that are or sediments that have not turned into rock yet but and they contain fossils of about one million years old so on our timeline activity that would be 50 centimeters all the way down to two millimeters like we talked about that's what our fossil record in alabama goes back 50 um, centimeters for us and then goes all the way up to that last um that last event that we put um the two millimeters one, our fossil record goes all the way back, or goes is as soon as two million years ago, all the way back to 50 centimeters, which I think is kind of neat. And there's the geologic map. Um, maybe I'm a little nerdy. Actually, I am, not maybe. I'm definitely a little nerdy. I love this map. Um, once I finally, I personally, um, I'm an Alabama transplant. I'm not from here originally, but when I got here, um, one of the first things that I learned about probably because I was working at the museum, was this geologic map. And it really has informed a lot of my nerdy passions, which is great. <laughs> um, but it also has been a really wonderful resource and a jumping off point for even modern day um, environmental lessons, modern day um, history lessons, um, and then, you know, deep time or, or geologic time lessons, just kind of like the one that we just did outside. And I also want to apologize for leaving. Something happened with connection. So I had to switch devices. I apologize for that. Um, but I was thinking too, um, one thing that I wanted to mention, and I'm sorry to cut guys off, but um, if you wanted to try this timeline activity um, in a different way, you can actually use it to make it of your week. So it doesn't have, you can use the same concept of a geologic timeline that we just did, but divide it up into you know, seven parts um, that would be for your week. So you can, um, especially while we're here in, in 24 hour in the quarantine or 24 hour stay at home, um, if you want to chronicle your week and the things that you did during the week, you can make a timeline activity very similar to what we did now and adapt it to that time frame. Um, so again, this lesson is really versatile and adaptable and almost limitless in the, the um, applications that can happen. But we, I think the three or four of us on the screen, um, definitely love the geologic lost. time one <laughs> um, and hope that you can utilize this in your, um, at your house. If you, get, if you have any questions about ways to adapt it and expand on it, um, please feel free to contact the museum uh, through the Facebook page or website and we can you know, offer advice um, or answer questions about it. John, were you having any connection? Hey, Ali, one thing I wanted to comment on when you were showing, you made the analogy early on about um, garbage can and how your older garbage is at the bottom. And, and um, yes. I just wanted to point out too, is that's the general rule, but um, I know enough geologists that, you know, the earth is not static and much like right. I've dropped my garbage. And if you do that, the garbage gets all mixed up and that happens right. in geology as well. So it's a good reminder. There are it many does. times where yes. people will find <laughs> things upside down. Um, when Adiel and I were looking for fossils on campus a couple of weeks ago, um, before we had to work from home, um, when we were looking at these exposed um, rocks along the Jack Warner Parkway on the southern side of the uh, Black Warrior River, you could see the separate layers. And he was actually showing me how you could see where they've been overturned, where basically they've been a storm event. These are probably a river sediments. And um, the direction had changed or they've been tilted. So mm -hmm. you get some, the youngest things are generally on top, but not always. I think that's something, there's always right. exceptions to the rules. So I just wanted to point that out to our audience. So there are sometimes you will find older rocks above younger rocks. Yeah, although that's very um, rare. 
Um, and, you know, if we go back to the geological map of Alabama, you can actually see that there's many exceptions mm -hmm. to this rule as well. This, the northern part of the state contains exclusively very old rocks of the Paleozoic age, from 500 to about 250 million years old. Right? All the younger rocks have either never been deposited on top of it or have been stripped off due to erosion. Mm -hmm. As we go to the mid part, we'll say we've got mostly Cretaceous age rock, so about 70, 80 million years old mostly. And nothing's on top of that, really. So, yes, it's a, you know, you can think of geology as, you know, a trash bin layer, the you, you, youngest one on top, the oldest ones on the bottom, it is the very ideal version, right? The reality is that yeah, erosion takes off layers that have been deposited or not deposited at all. So you can see actually all the rock layers as well on the surface of Alabama, which helps paleontologists and geologists a big deal, actually understanding the broader history of Alabama. Yeah. Is that part of what makes geology really interesting is that it's kind of this big, it sounds like sort of like a big mystery that you put together with more clues that you gather. Well, it's a puzzle with many missing pieces. That's how you can uh, really summarize geology and paleontology. Because the reality is we're missing uh, quite some rocks even from Alabama, even though our fossil record in Alabama is relatively complete compared to many other states. We've got Cambrian all the way up to Pleistocene. Yet we don't have much of the Jurassic on the surface. We don't mm -hmm. have much of uh, some other periods, uh, for example, Triassic on the surface. So we're missing lots of pieces there. So for this other missing piece, we have to go to the States to learn what's, what's going on in the, in the Jurassic and Triassic, for example. Um, the other thing that is kind of neat to point out in this respect is that you've got lots of Cretaceous rocks in Alabama, particularly the late part of the Cretaceous from about, let's say, 85 million years old to about 66 million years old to the very end of the Cretaceous period. But it doesn't mean it's complete. It doesn't mean that we have rocks and fossils that represent every day uh, in Alabama at a time. Mm -hmm. So even even when it's a relatively complete record of the late Cretaceous, there's going to be some gaps in the record. Gaps of Which, time that are not represented by a rock and thus fossils. Those fossils are embedded within the rock. So, so uh, basically what you're saying is we can keep this geologic time yarn activity up forever and then as new things are being discovered, we can just add them to our timeline. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. If, for example, the oldest reptiles, right, they are now 320 million years old, as you showed, it's very likely some that are a little bit older will show up mm -hmm. in due time. So maybe we have to move this, this, this line or this, uh, this paper, uh, with a 320 million year note, maybe have to move it a little bit um, for the decades. So as, as discoveries go on, all these lines will shift a little bit toward a right to other time limits. That's wonderful. I think that's great. So basically, just keep this yarn thing taped to your driveway forever and then just keep adding as things go. I think that sounds reasonable, right, everyone? Yeah. Hey, Allie and, and Adi, I was going. I I posted earlier this week on the museum's Facebook page about free apps that you can use, and one of the ones I recently discovered is something called Rocked. Um, that is a basically you can go out and, and it will use your smart device to tell you like based on your geolocation um, what time frames are, and you can actually record those. Um, it's kind of it's kind of like iNaturalist for geologists. And I only discovered it recently, uh, but it's something uh, I'm going to use more and more when I go out, when I see exposed rock faces to kind of take a picture. And it's kind of neat. It'll, it'll give, tell you on a broad scale kind of what rocks you should be see exposed in your area. Uh, so it's a great way. The other thing I'm going to post is something about the Digital Atlas of Life. Um, this also is, is an app that exists um, that can kind of give you a real broad overview for diversity of life. So um, one of the things we're doing um, during this period where we're at home is I'm going to be constantly posting about free apps that I think are really useful that uh, we focused a little bit on nature related apps, but th these also exist for geology and paleontology. Um, so there are great resources out there where you can go out with your kids and um, 
basically use some of these apps to do a little exploration, uh, document what rocks are exposed in your neighborhood. Uh, maybe your kid has a question about um, a particular type of trilobite or some other fossil organism. Uh, you can just pull it up on your phone. Um, so there's just there's so many online resources, and I think uh, it's a great time uh, as long as you've got internet connectivity to use these to uh, you know educate yourself and your families about the past deep history in Alabama and beyond. And um, in that, can we swap back to the um, the slides one last time, Rebecca? Sure thing. Thanks. The very last one um, has some resources, just a couple of resources. There are way more than these. Um, a logic time. Um, and so they're not apps necessarily, but they are websites that could be helpful to you um, if you are looking to research more events that are geologic time-based. Um, to add to your uh, yarn activity that you're just gonna make a permanent decoration in your house so you can keep adding to, just kidding. But um, so uh, these activity or these uh, websites um, and the Lost Worlds and Alabama Rocks book, um, which you can find online, are wonderful um, resources that can help you when you hopefully are able to adapt to this activity a little bit. Um, to your needs, to fit your needs. Yeah. Are you all seeing Allie. the slide on the screen? Um, I'm not seeing them. Um, okay, all right. Let me let me uh, let me try that again. A few oh, other things that I like. You are. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're looking at the slide. A few other go. things I can plug are, um, you know, Allie mentioned Thank the you, Lost Worlds in Alabama Rocks book. Uh, we sell it at the museum, but obviously we're not open right now. But I think you can get it through Amazon. Yes. Um, we also have a National Fossil Day every year. It's already happened this year, but uh, it's an event where we have at the museum uh, on the UA campus that I invite people that are interested to come. It's a family-friendly event. Uh, there also always are in October. Always in October, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll be hopefully we'll be open by then. Uh, the <laughs> other thing is there are some active paleontology groups. Um, there's an Alabama and a Birmingham paleontology group which have meetings. Uh, so there are all kinds of opportunities, uh, particularly if you're in Alabama, to engage. We have an incredible fossil record um, that you really, you can almost anywhere you live, there's probably a place locally you can find fossils if you know where to look and, and what to look for. Um, so I want to just put a plug in for those. Uh, if you have questions, reach out to us on social media. Uh, like I said, we've got Adiel here who is a great resource. Um, I, Allie and I can help you out. We do the public exhibits with the museum, and but for really deep paleo stuff, I turned to Adiel. We have the geologic survey folks that are on the campus as well. They're a great resource. So uh, we're we're really fortunate in the state to have a lot of local resources that we can help uh, school kids and families with their paleontology, fossil geology related questions. All right. Well, we have uh, two minutes left. Um, are, are there, uh, Allie, do you, do you have any, uh, last minute thoughts about, uh, the activity we did today or, uh, deep time uh, that you want to leave the audience with? Um, I think just to know that lessons, even like these ones are absolutely possible at home, um, and possible with things that are just around the house. Um, and to know that there's a lot of support and resources, just like we've been mentioning to help um, cover this topic. If this is something that your students at home are interested in, you can easily um, make it work with this is available with us at the museum um, and with just things that you find around the house. All right, well, I think that's gonna do it for this museum from your home live stream. We've, we've run out of time, so, uh, but we are going to be doing something like this every weekday, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. Uh, next time around on Monday, we're going to get to Moundville. So uh, head over to the Moundville Archaeological uh, Parks Facebook page on Monday at 10 a.m. to check that out. And for a full live stream schedule and links to our Color Our Collections coloring book and Discovering Alabama's Online Educational Resources, which has some stuff on today's topic, uh, you can watch their free episodes and check out their teacher guides. Uh, you can do all of that at museums.ua.edu slash museums from your home. That will have our, our full live stream schedule and all of our resources that we'd like to uh, let you know about there. Well, thank you uh, to everybody for visiting UA Museums from your home. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks for coming out. Thank you everyone. Us. Stay safe. Take care. Have fun. Bye.